Hi, I'm Patrick Manning at Black Desert Resort. We are proud sponsors of Beyond the Game. I recognize that wins aren't always measured by points. Scoreboards don't always define champions, but the story this athlete has to tell, it does. This is why Black Desert Golf Course is proud to sponsor Beyond the Game to share this inspiring story with you. Please enjoy. You're listening to the Utah Checkdown Podcast. And now your host, Josh Furlong. Welcome back to another edition of the Utah Checkdown Podcast. I am Josh Furlong. Once again, happy to be back and talking football. We're getting close, guys. We're, we're you know about two weeks away from real football being played. Uh, if you're into the week zero games, uh, that's happening uh, much quicker. So we're we're close, right? We're, we we've had some things happen on uh, the Utah football field that that we're going to talk about today and uh, kind of get into it. So uh, there's there's actual fun stuff to talk about instead of just the random musings of uh, speculation. It's all still speculation. Let's be real, but. I'm um, excited to talk about a little bit more of that kind of stuff, so uh, let's jump into it. But first, I want to uh, tell you about our partners, Black Desert, who are helping with the KSL.com Beyond the Game video series. The videos highlight various athletes and give an inside look into their life. Recently, we talked with former Utah offensive lineman Garrett Bowles about how a second chance at life allowed him to pay it forward to troubled youth. You can check out that video and many others on KSL.com. Black Desert is a new resort destination in St. George that features a championship Tom Weiskopf 19-hole golf course that combines a private club feel with destination resort golf amid lava fields and 360-degree vistas. Black Desert is changing entertainment in southern Utah, and they're just beginning. Black Desert, where Remarkable is within reach, home of the Black Desert Championship PGA Tour. All right, let's let's jump into this. Now, before we get into fall camp, uh, we're going to just do a real quick look at uh, where Utah landed in the AP poll uh, by now, you probably know, so this is not uh, coming as a surprise. Uh, Utah jumps in at number 12. They are the highest-ranked team in the Big 12, as they were in the coaches' poll. Uh, not not a lot of difference. Obviously, number 13 in the coaches' poll, number 12 in, in the AP poll. Uh, the AP poll, you know, for all intents and purposes, is considered kind of the quote-unquote official poll until the college football playoff poll comes out. And so uh, this, is, this is kind of a, a good look at where Utah's at. Um, this is their eighth time... Eighth time all time, there you go, say that three times fast, uh, being ranked inside the preseason poll. The crazy thing is, is this is the sixth consecutive season that they've been ranked in the preseason. So of all those eight, you're living in the era of the last, you know, there's six, right? Beyond that, there was two. That's pretty crazy about how uh, how that's worked. Kyle Whittingham has, has developed this team into uh, uh, a winning machine. And uh, it, it pays off. People respect Utah and put them in there. Even that 2020 season where it went off the rails and COVID happened, Utah was ranked there. So uh, this is a sign of respect for Utah. Obviously being ranked inside the top 15 is always a, a good mark for a program. This is the second highest preseason ranking that they've ever had. Number seven uh, came in 2022. Um, but this is this is a team that, that clearly has a, a lot of optimism surrounding it. We've talked about that. That's not a surprise to any Utah fan, obviously, or anybody else that's listening to this podcast that may not be a fan of the Utes. Um, but this is this is a team that you know if you're inside that top 15, I feel like you know there's there's a good amount of, of expectations for a team. Anyone in that top 15 is easily eligible for the college football playoffs this year. Uh, there's going to be a lot of expectations heaped upon them. Um, and so you're going to see that with Utah, right? I, I My, my uh, poll that I submit to the AP, I had Utah at 10. Uh, honestly, I could see Utah anywhere from 8 to 12. There were a couple of voters that had Utah ha- as high as number 5. Uh, one had Utah as low as 21. You know, it, it happens. At, at the end of the day, like, you're in that kind of general range of anywhere from 8 to f- maybe even 15 that's kind of where you, you can kind of see the, the bulk of, of those, those votes coming in. Either, you know, it's, it's a good sign for Utah. So we'll leave it at that. Beyond Utah, Oklahoma State in the AP poll is ranked 17th. They were actually below Kansas State in the coaches poll, um, but above Kansas State here. Kansas State comes in at 18. 
Arizona at 21, Kansas 22, Iowa State, West Virginia, and Colorado all received votes. Uh, not many votes, but they got some. Colorado got literally one uh, 25th place vote. So, uh, you know, good for them. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But this, this, you know, take take it for a grain as a grain of salt, right? It's it it means nothing. It means everything. It, it it's whatever you want it to mean. So, uh, I'll get people yelling at me all the time about my ballot or or the fact that we rank teams this early. It, it's really just you know a projection. It's really just a sign of of respect for these teams and kind of the trajectory that they're they're moving forward with. So, kind of fun. Uh, last week, I, I kind of talked about the playoff scenario. Not really much changed. Uh, Utah, obviously, as the highest Big 12 team, would get that auto buy. They'd stay the number four seed. Nothing changed there. Georgia, Ohio State, Florida State, Utah get the buys. Uh, all the same teams got the, the at-large bids, except in the coaches' poll, Memphis would have gotten the, the last remaining conference bid, uh, Boise State. In this one would get that one. They'd be the 12 seed facing Oregon, which would then face Utah for a Fiesta Bowl uh, matchup. Um, it, it, you know, it, it would be a lot of fun. Uh, I, I think Utah probably wouldn't want to face Oregon just after all the years of playing them. But I mean, any of these teams that Utah would have to play as the, uh, you know, a, a, another round, it's going to be tough. You've got Texas, Michigan, who would then play Florida State in the Peach Bowl, Alabama and Penn State, the winner of that playing Ohio State in the Rose Bowl, and Ole Miss and Notre Dame uh, playing, you know, the winner of that playing Georgia in the Sugar Bowl. None of those are easy games. If anything, the fifth seed, you know, Oregon, which is the fifth seed, they have the easiest path because they have to face, you know, a 12th seed, uh, meaning Boise State. Not to say that that's an easy path, but then you also get the lowest of the the conference uh, teams. And, you know, if, if Oregon, as it stands right now, is ranked third and then Utah is ranked 12th, uh, that, that remains a competitive advantage in terms of how the rankings go and, and kind of the perception of how that is. So in theory, that number five seed could actually have a very good advantage going into this. Um, you know, Utah fans are going to say if it is Utah, that's, that not, that's not an advantage, but uh, we'll leave that at that. So that's that's the AP poll. We're not going to get too much into it. I spent too much time on that. That's all that matters. But we're into fall camp. And Utah had their first scrimmage last week. If This this was the one that uh, really is going to separate the, you know, the two deep versus the rest of the team, right? This is where the pecking order is going to come into shape. Uh, you're going to get the guys that you already maybe know the starters because most of them have been kind of identified already. There's still a few uh, that the pecking order is still shaping up. Uh, and then moving on beyond that, it's really just kind of getting those reps and, and getting it for the, the ones and twos and then kind of whittling it down after that. Today, actually, at, at about the same time that we're, where I'm, I'm doing this podcast, the second scrimmage will be taking place. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get some details potentially tomorrow. We get a chance to talk to the assistant coaches tomorrow for the last time before the season starts. Uh, so we'll get a little bit of an update on kind of how they view the team uh, but we got some good updates, right? I, I think the biggest update, and, and Kyle prefaced his whole update on scrimmage of last week as really good, um, but the biggest part that he said is, is the best part about it was nobody went down with an injury, so that was a positive, a huge positive. And, you know, every year that's a positive, but I think after what Utah experienced last year, uh, this becomes the biggest win of all. You know, it, it's, it's something that uh, Utah is very happy to have. That's not to say guys aren't, you know, nicked up or, or there's not different scratches or bumps or minor injuries. Um, but this is a team that coming out of their first scrimmage is relatively healthy. Uh, you're going to see going into the second scrimmage, there's, there's going to be reps had from those ones and two guys. But for the most part, um, you're not going to get anything too hard, right? They're not going to push these guys because they need them to play the season. So they're not going to have a lot of uh, drills that are, are going to put them in harm's way. That's not to say things can't happen, but uh, that's kind of where they're at. So good news for that. Uh, by and large, the, the scrimmage went well. Uh, they were able to figure out a lot of the things that they needed to, and that mostly being the depth chart. Uh, you know, we'll get a formal depth chart probably the week of uh, the Southern Utah game, so that Monday, maybe Sunday if we're lucky, maybe even earlier if we're lucky. I don't know. Uh, it just depends. But uh, that that is, that is the good news. Uh, there's no injuries, at least major injuries. So uh, Utah's coming into the season relatively healthy. Obviously, there's a few guys that were banged up and, and nixed from the season early on, but that happened more in spring, so uh, they're good. But, I know, 
the the biggest news of the day uh, on Monday when Kyle talked to us as the media was the QB battle, right? Like we we know that Cam Rising is a starter. That was never really the question. Uh, the question was always who was going to be that QB two. You had Brandon Rose, who'd been in the system for three years, uh, was really making a lot of, of strides, and, and, and by all accounts, everybody said that he was doing the things that he needed to to progress, right? Uh, there was a lot of optimism last year that uh, had he not got injured in fall camp, maybe he would have been uh, in the mix for the starting quarterback job. That, you know, that injury changed a lot of things, and even at the end of the season when he was relatively cleared, he wasn't fully cleared, but he was there, he he just wasn't ready, right? He he wasn't able to get through the the typical things that you need to do as a quarterback, maybe going through progressions, uh, going beyond just one read. I think last year, well, I know last year we saw a lot of the quarterbacks, they would get their one read and they'd have a hard time going through their progressions. They couldn't see anything beyond that first read. Uh, and so, you know, if that that's really what limited Utah a ton last year beyond, you know, some, some natural talent and different things that way. But um, this, you know, Brandon was making progress. We'll just leave it at that. So he was he was in a battle. A lot of people expected him to fight with Isaac. Obviously, coming out of spring, uh, the the two of them were were locked, you know, neck and neck, as Kyle said. Uh, and you know, Isaac coming in as a freshman, being locked in the battle with Brandon Rose was a good thing for Isaac, but you could kind of say it was a bad thing for for Brandon, right? If you have a freshman coming in here, pushing you on the playbook, pushing you in your talent. Uh, that's that's not generally a good thing for you to be able to get the starting minutes. Then in the summer, they add Sam Heward. You know, I talked about Sam last week, and you can listen to kind of who he is and kind of his development and where he's at. Sam obviously was behind it a little bit because he joined the program a month before fall camp. So that's not a lot of time, a lot of lead-up time to really get into the system, to understand Eddie Ludwig's playbook, which is very difficult to understand at times. There's a lot available to you, and, you know, it, it, it's easy once, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's, it's better once you can understand it. The problem is, is you're coming into this now having to go to fall camp uh, a month away. You're jumping up from the FCS level back up to, you know, the FBS level, uh, a team that has a great defense. This is a tough challenge. And so, you know, Sam was always going to kind of be at a disadvantage. But with that to say, you know, there was a real uh, possibility that he could be in that mix to, to win that QB2 job. You know, he has experience. He's He's played with some of the best players at Washington. You know, it, 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 was, it was there, essentially. In the end, though, Kyle Whittingham named Isaac Wilson uh, QB2. They feel like he has a lot of, of what they need. Uh, he said, Kyle said, Isaac continues to get better each day. He's seeing the field better. He's making better decisions. He's got a live arm. Ball comes out of his hand like he's supposed to. Very mobile. And that's another facet is that he's really... That's really his strength, that he's able to have a lot of escapability in the pocket. He senses the rush very well, able to get himself out of jams, and he still is able to make a play on the move. That, that's, a, you know, that's a glowing endorsement for Isaac Wilson, especially coming in as a freshman. Anybody that's followed this program for a long time knows that Kyle does not just you know, give praise to somebody just because he has to, right? He has to talk up his QB2. He, he, he's very honest in his approach, and that's not to say that Isaac is the perfect player yet, right? And, and Isaac recognizes that. He understands where he's at. Um, but this is a guy that has really come out there, and, uh, you know, word out of camp was that first week, it was, it was kind of rough for Isaac, as you would expect. He's a freshman. He's coming in here. Uh, this isn't spring anymore where, where things are going to be much tougher, and, and it was a little bit of a rough go. But then as he kind of shook that off and came back into it, he attacked it really hard, and, and, and the separation was night and day. Uh, Kyle made that clear. You know, it was, it was a night and day difference with, with Isaac. He's got a good arm. You know, he's able to make those reads, and those windows are still going to close faster than they were in high school, and so that's something that he still has to learn. But he's not afraid to take that, right? He's got to be able to, to continue to finesse it a little bit, but he's got that moxie to be able to, to move it forward. And so any, any you know, non-separation between the two or three quarterbacks, that kind of levels it up a little bit for, for Isaac, where he's able to be that, that player that's just going to say, you know, I'm going to go do it, right? At least he's willing to try it instead of being a little bit more timid and not willing to make that. You need a quarterback that is going to be decisive. You need a quarterback that's going to go out there and make those plays, knowing that you're going to make mistakes, right? There's going to be an interception there, especially when you're young. Uh, you're going to find those windows that aren't, aren't there that they were in high school, but Isaac is willing to take that. And you saw that in spring, 
in spring, he gets out on the field and, and instantly it was kind of like the cam rising effect is how I kind of look at it. A lot of the, the team kind of rallied around him. He just has that confidence where he goes out there, he knows what he's doing. Even if he maybe doesn't know what he's doing, he knows how to make plays, right? And, and sure, in spring, it's a, it's a pretty vanilla defense, and uh, you know he, he's making plays against a team that isn't really pushing it too much. But you're seeing that level of, of, of talent there where he's not going to shy away from, from whatever's at him, you know? And if, you know, whatever happens to Cam, if, if Isaac were to get in there, you know he's going to make those plays. He's going to make mistakes, right? He's going to, the first time you, he throws an interception, that's to me where you're going to see how he responds. And everything that, you know, we've, we've talked to him or anybody else about, he responds well. That, that kind of th- fires him up to, to get better, you know. It, it, it's part of the game where if you're going to be a quarterback, you have to be willing to take the praise and you've got to be willing to take the criticism. And when something goes wrong, how do you respond? Are you blaming your team? Are you, are you building them up? Are you saying that's on me? You know, whatever the, the situation is, Isaac has seemingly got that, Right. We, we won't see him probably unless it's garbage minutes or if Cam gets hurt, um, but they feel confident that that's the case. Now, what does that mean for Brandon Rose? Honestly, if you're a fan, I, I, and I mean this in the nicest way, like you shouldn't care, right? Like if Brandon Rose can't beat out a quarterback in three seasons, it doesn't matter, right? Like you want the guy that's going to be in there, right? And maybe that lights a fire under Brandon. Maybe it's like, you know, that, that helps him. But at the end of the day, you want a guy that's going to be in there and, and, and fight for it. I'm not saying Brandon didn't fight for it. I think everything that we've read about him and talked to him about and everything about who he is as a person, he's supremely confident in himself, but he hasn't been able to win that job. And so if you're still having some Brandon Rose, you know, love and, and you want him to do well, sure, that's great. Like you should want him to do well. But at the end of the day, you want the quarterback that's going to step up. And if Brandon can make those strides and be QB3 and kind of help the team in that facet, great. If he decides to transfer, I don't know that that hurts Utah. Obviously depth, you want depth because all it takes is, you know, one quarterback to go down after another. And that has happened in teams before. But at the same time, you want a guy that is able to, to be in the mix that, that is going to fight that battle. Once again, I don't think that Brandon hasn't been willing to fight that battle. I just don't think he's been able to understand Ludwig's system the way that they want, which is why he keeps getting passed over from Bryson Barnes, uh, Nate Johnson, now Isaac Wilson. You know, it, it's going to be a much tougher challenge. Now, Sam Heward, that, that's, that maybe is a different story because he's coming into this new. You want, to succeed, you want him to succeed, right? You want that battle next year for the quarterback where you have Isaac Wilson, you have Sam Heward, assuming that he decides to stay on the roster. Brandon Rose, if he decides to stay, you know, we'll see that. I, I would have to imagine he probably looks to go elsewhere if he wants to play football. And then you bring in Wyatt Becker, a freshman. Now, you're going to have a battle for that starting job, and, and Isaac will obviously have that 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 lead start, especially if he gets, you know, significant minutes this season where he's able to be in garbage time or, or injury play, uh, you know, that, that helps him. Regardless, this becomes a great battle next year, and that's where Sam kind of fits in, in my opinion. He comes in, he can fight that battle. To me, it still feels like Isaac is the future. I, you know, I know I'm, I'm going so far out on the limb right here, but I think everything about this kid uh, kind of screams the future. He He's learning under Cam Rising. He's humble. He's receptive. He's got that fire under him where he's going to do whatever he can. That says a lot when you're a freshman quarterback that you can come in there and be that level of, of talent where everybody's kind of looking at that. So, I, you know, I've, I've gone on a long time about that, but I think this is a great sign for Utah, right? You, you've got your quarterback of the future, in theory, right there for you. I, I, I think he's got a great leg up, you know, as long as he continues to keep working and continues to get in that system, keeps getting that mentorship from Cam Rising, who understands, you know, defenses and scheming them so well. If you can get just a little bit of that and give that to Isaac, that sets Utah up for tremendous amounts of success moving forward. Once again, it still has to be done on the field, right? Like you can't just say Isaac is heir apparent and everything's going to be great. He's going to take his lumps and there's going to be things that happen. But he clearly has the brightest future of this this group, uh, and, and I think you're going to get a lot of, of talent that kind of comes around that, right? You're going to find people that want to play for Isaac because he's already kind of rallied the troops, so to speak. A lot of people talk about him as the guy. That is a great thing to have, and, and you hear in football 
uh, teams a lot where captains aren't necessarily like a, a, a coach can name a captain, but captains often are generally just kind of, I don't want to even say assumed, but it kind of, they rally or the teams rally around the captains, right? They're the guys that everybody's drawn to. Maybe they're the vocal type. Maybe they're the ones that just exude confidence. Whatever the reason, teams rally around certain players. And quarterback's an easy position there, but that doesn't always happen, right? Guys at the quarterback position aren't always the most vocal, and they're not the easiest ones to get along with. With uh, Cam, you know, you got a lot of that. You saw the difference when he was inserted into that San Diego State game years ago. Everything changed for Utah. I'm getting that sense with Isaac, and I don't want to get too far out here and say that, you know, Isaac is is on the level of Cam or could be, but I think, you know, the, the, the steps are being made, and I think that's a good thing for Utah. It's a great opportunity for the team to be able to have that already set, um, and it's it, it, it's a good situation to be in. So, you know, we, t- we talked to Isaac after that. Uh, it, was, it was kind of fortunate that uh, we, we all kind of saw this coming. I requested Isaac to... Uh, talk to that day. I'm sure many other people, I don't go around to the other media and asking who they picked, but uh, we did get Isaac and I'm going to play the interview that, that we got with him. Um, he, you know, he remains very committed and he remains, you know, very eager to learn, but he's a humble kid, right? He's, he's ready to learn and he wants to be able to understand that there's still more, right? He's got that job as the QB two, but there's still more to learn. So I'm going to play that and uh, we'll go from there. Isaac Kyle named you QB2 today, at least publicly to us. I mean, how does it feel coming in your first year to have that? I mean, it's just a great opportunity for me to even be here. Um, the offensive staff, everyone's been doing so much for me. And I'm just trying to give back by being on top of my plays, helping around. But, um, I mean, of course it's a good feeling, but i got to keep working. What, what pushes you? All of it. My teammates, my family, just playing this game. I mean, all of it, really. Yeah. Isaac, what's been your mindset throughout camp? I got to work. I just got to keep working. I'm just a freshman. I haven't earned anything yet. And the coaches always say, we need the team more than they know, uh, they need us. And I, I, I stand true to that. So I just want to come out here and ball, do my best, learn everything, and uh, just have fun. Kyle, Kyle said there was no way you'd even be in contention if you weren't here in the spring. Mm-hmm. How much did your spring experience help you to where you are Oh, my goodness. Um, you guys must know Coach, Lo- Coach Led's offense. This is a very – complicated but it's needed this offense is everything you need and um just coming here early learning everything the x's and o's um has really pushed me forward i think and all of this extra like our bread and butter plays aren't that bread and butter about uh, most people but just getting here early has really boosted me forward two freshmen aren't supposed to be able to come in here this fast and learn a complex offense like that what what, what strength do you have that enabled you to and uh, in- kind of absorb all this so quickly i felt like i was put in a good position um by my family and my coaches in high school um having my older brother zach of course um he's been helping me throughout this whole journey and i mean he's been going through his own journey too so we're working through this together and i mean my coach uh, coach in high school coach care um he, he got some of these concepts from utah so it's, it's been a journey you, you have to like what what isaac said there right like he he remains he remains humble he understands where he needs to be uh, even in spring, you know, after a, a great spring game, he talked about needing to learn a ton more, right? That's what you want as a quarterback. You you want him to have the swagger kind of like Rising does where you're going to go into battle and he's going to be the one to lead the charge. He's going to he's going to not shrink from that fight. Um, but he's humble enough to know that that he's able to do uh, whatever he needs to to be able to get better. And so I think that's that's a great situation for Utah. You've got a great quarterback there. Uh, it, it was interesting to kind of talk about uh, that that point that that Daniel Green brought up about how he was able to get into the mix as a freshman. Um, Kyle Whittingham had said he would not have had the opportunity to start this fall, in my opinion, if he had not had the spring experience and the summer experience for that matter. And it's to the point now where roughly 50%, maybe a little more of high school recruits are mid-year guys. It is such an advantage academically as well as football-wise. That's a big reason why you're starting to see a lot of these players, especially the players that there's uh, an expectation where they can potentially play that first year, that that fall, where they're coming in in spring, right? You're getting that system. You're getting those off-season workouts where you're not trying to pick up all of what Utah wants you to do in the summer. They're giving you stuff, right? Like Utah's, once you've signed, they're giving you stuff and helping you and trying to say, okay, here's what you need to do. But it's it's a difference when you get into that spring camp and you're you're actually learning the system and sure those those defenses are 
uh, watered down, you know, for, for the offensive guys when you're playing against them. But this is an opportunity for them to understand what it's like to acclimate, so to speak, and, and get there so that by the time fall camp comes, you've acclimated to a point where you understand it. It's not going to be perfect, especially for the freshmen. You know, that speed changes things. Uh, the game you know, everybody talks about it slowing down. That takes time, and it's going to take time even if if Isaac is named the starter at one point. But you you get into that where you understand it, especially in Andy Ludwig's system where you need to have that lead-up time or else you're going to be behind. And I think that's where where you're kind of getting some of that with Isaac and how he's able to compete. Obviously, there's there's more beyond that, right? Brandon's been in the system for three years, and he's still not there yet. Isaac has done it in, you know, what, seven months, whatever that time frame is. That shows kind of his intellect, his ability to kind of digest that stuff, his moxie to be able to just keep moving forward, that confidence, that swagger, whatever, you know, adjective you want to describe for that, that's great. I don't want to sit here and spend all this time, you know, hyping up a, a backup quarterback. You know, the backup quarterback is always the the favorite, is, is, is that phrase. But I, I think at this point, this is a good thing for Utah. You know, we'll see how it goes. We'll see what kind of play he gets. I know some people worry about redshirt freshmen. You know, can you, you redshirt him? I don't think it matters. If you're the QB2, you, you're going into this knowing that you get to play. And so if there's a chance that Utah can save him for those four games, great. You know, then you get him for a full four years after that. At this, at this level, that doesn't really happen. Guys either aren't staying for four years generally, uh, especially ones that are, are kind of projected to be talented where they're at right now. You know, Isaac being named QB2, he's probably going to have a future beyond that if he's able to get to that level. Uh, that that is quicker, right? Maybe he has four years, but I don't think redshirt needs to be of concern. Utah will do whatever they can to put him in a position to succeed. They want to do everything they can to preserve his eligibility, but at the same time, you need a guy behind Cam, you know, where you're one play away where he's in, into that game. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I think it'll be a lot of fun to be able to see how that is. I would have to imagine uh, that we see Isaac, Maybe by halftime in that Southern Utah game, I think that would be the ideal plan for Utah is that they come into that, they they dictate the, the terms of that game, get a huge lead and let Isaac and maybe some of the other quarterbacks finish out the fourth quarter. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. So some other updates from, from fall camp, uh, really more just the tight ends. Uh, tight ends, you know, it's, in, it's insane how many tight ends that Utah has this year. Uh, Kyle says that they confidently have six tight ends that they plan to use this season. Uh, Freddie Whittingham had said that they have various packages where two different uh, tight ends will be used in their 12 personnel. They can go big. They can go, you know, uh, where they're trying to get uh, more of a jumbo package, where they're trying to get more of a, a route you know, running package. Uh, there, there's a whole bunch of packages that they can use in just that base 12 personnel for the team with these six different tight ends. You know, some of them are going to just stay in and be blockers. Some are going to be route runners, you know, pass catchers. You know, there's there's just so many ways that you can mix and match this, and they're really excited about that because all of them have such a unique skill set that allows Utah to be able to really be diverse, right? You, you can put Brant Keithy out there, which is, is going to be one of the smaller tight ends on the team. He's going to be in that slot position where he can still – be kind of your traditional tight end where he can be on the line and block, although Utah doesn't use him as much there, especially with them having a bunch. He becomes a mismatch where he's a bigger-bodied uh, receiver who has a lot of uh, shiftiness and, 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 and ability. You have a bunch of these other guys. I mean, you've got a Caleb Lohner who's coming in and learning football essentially for the first time at 6'8". You know, he's a huge body. Then you've got, you know, Carson Ryan, who's done it at, at UCLA. Landon King, who's obviously done it at Utah and has become a fan favorite, and everybody sees his potential. Miki Sugurataga, you know, Kyle called him one of the most consistent tight ends in everything he does this fall. Last year, he made the switch from the defensive side to tight end, and it was kind of a tough experience for him. It's, it's, it's tough to be able to learn that and learn how you need to, to move and in that time period, you know, he took his lumps. Last year he took his lumps, and there at the end of the season you started to see him catching, uh, you know, I remember him catching a touchdown, and he was making some progress. He's essentially made tremendous strides over the year and is going to be a problem. He's, he's going to be great for Utah. Uh, you know, you've got a lot of, of opportunities in this room. And, you know, say what you will about the wide receivers, which have obviously increased as well. 
even if you just had this tight end group, I think Utah has enough to be able to do what they need to. So all good things for Utah. The fact that you're getting Caleb Lohner progressing, Kyle said he's doing a great job and he's ahead of the curve, you know, more than what they've expected. There's still some technique things like getting his pads down, making sure that he's not kind of uh, too exposed uh, in, in terms of, of kind of players taking advantage of him. It's more of the leverage. Uh, and so you'll, you'll kind of get him learning that a little bit more. Uh, but that comes with being a bigger bodied athlete and, and trying to understand how that works with pads and, and not just uh, saying, I'm going to go catch that ball. He has a huge catch radius. Uh, if you've seen any of the social media videos, Loner, I think, caught two of the touchdowns, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, at the very least, he caught one. Uh, it's an athletic catch. Uh, this is a guy that uh, is willing to do everything he can to be able to get that ball. So uh, we'll, we'll see how he develops. That's another name that I'm really um, curious to, to, to learn. Uh, not curious to learn his name, but see him on the field and uh, understand kind of how he develops as as a tight end. So this is this is shaping up to be arguably Utah's best. Uh, I think they've got great opportunities here to be able to mix and match. Uh, you're going to see, like I said, that base 12 personnel with two tight ends out. Uh, they're going to go 13, probably 14 personnel as well, try to mix a lot of these guys in. So you're going to see a lot of packages that may be unique to this season just because of the talent they have. Uh, regardless, Andy Ludwig is going to have a heyday uh, with the, the mismatches that he has, you know, bringing guys in. You know, who do you, who do you guard? Do you guard Brent Keithy or Carson Ryan? Landon King, Caleb Lohner. You know, which guy are you going to guard? Uh, and then how do you kind of mix and match that? Is that DB going to be able to match up with them? That nickel, the safety, linebacker, whatever you want to put on them, it becomes a mismatch, and it's not an e exactly easy scenario. So uh, it's it's going to be a great situation for Utah in terms of tight ends. So then there's the, the running back depth. There's a lot here. We're talking a lot of offense today. So running back depth, you know, going back to... Uh, even last year, I mean, even when Jaquin and Jackson was on the team, he was he was clearly the starter, but he hadn't fully separated himself yet in terms of being able to just really take the bulk of the carries. And yes, a lot of that had to do with his nagging ankle injury that he continually dealt with all season. You know, he'd go in, he'd get a couple plays and have to go back out, tape it up a little bit more, take a shot. I don't know what he had to do to like uh, make sure that, uh, uh, you know, he was able to get out there and play. And kudos to him for getting it done. He, he found a way to do it and, and led Utah in rushing and, and was a great asset for Utah. After that, though, they, they, they didn't really have a guy, right? Like you had Mackay Bernard, you had Jalen Glover, you had some other guys that, that are in the room and they're talented and they're, you know, they have veteran experience and they're learning, but there hasn't been a guy yet to separate. Coming into fall camp, Kyle had said that he wanted to be able to have uh, well, he didn't necessarily spell out that he wanted a, a bell cow back, right? That every down back. He was more curious on what it was going to be. Were they going to be a running back by committee? Was a guy going to step up? Quinton Ganther said similarly the same thing. You know, he, I think they all want a guy to step up because that's easier for a team, right? It's easy to say, we're going to give this to X player and allow him to kind of take the bulk. And then we can mix and match some of these other talented backs in different packages to kind of help that. Right now, there really isn't any separation. Uh, Kyle said there's, there's some tiers. You've got tier one, which is essentially Makai Bernard, Jalen Glover, and Mike Mitchell. Uh, if you remember, he's a redshirt freshman coming in there. There's been a lot of talk about Mike Mitchell, and I'll get into him in a little bit. Um, and then tier two, there's Hunter Andrews, who moved over as a linebacker. Uh, Charlie Vincent, who's a walk-on, who continues to show out. Uh, he's been in the system for a long time and has, has been a great asset as well as Dijon Stanley. He's a smaller-bodied back. Uh, he, he'd be used in, in much different situations than any of those guys uh, ahead of him. Uh, still has some, some skill sets, you know, his speed especially, that will allow him to uh, be utilized in a way that, that can kind of help Utah. Uh, maybe you put in two backs and he's one, and, and you kind of mix and match how that works. Uh, honestly, you could use any of these tight ends as kind of a fullback in some respects, and uh, utilize any of these running backs in that way. So, you know, there's a lot of, of things that you can once again mix and match. But focusing on that tier one, those are going to be the three guys that at least initially, well, and I don't even think initially, I think those three guys are going to be the ones that get the bulk of the carries, right? I think going into to the game, unless something changes today with their, their second scrimmage or in the next, you know, weekish, uh, you know, I don't, I don't imagine that to happen. This is going to be 
how they kind of approach it. My my guess is, and this isn't an, uh, you know a tough guess to have, but it's you're going to go into that Southern Utah game and you're going to find which guy kind of dominates, right? You're going to go into it and you're going to say, Makai Bernard is kind of the guy we'll start with, assuming that's who we start with. Then it's Jalen Glover or Mike Mitchell, whichever that is, and whoever is able to kind of separate themselves from the pack in the games, you're going to start to see that kind of coalesce around them, right? You see that from time to time. Tavion, uh, a few years ago, he, he hadn't done the things in practice to really get where he needed to be to be named the the starting running back. But once he got into the games, he did everything that he needed to to be able to separate, right? You saw it was a clear difference that he was the best running back out on the field. There were obvious, you know, issues beyond that, and, and we're not going to get into that. But I think once you get those bright lights on and you get them in the game and they're going up against defenses that aren't your own and they understand your, you know, your traits and your personalities, this becomes a different challenge, Right. Makai Bernard has the best advantage of anyone, anybody because he's been in the system for a long time. He knows how to do it. He's one of the team's best pass blockers. You know, he's kind of your complete back. You've got then Jalen Glover, who is really starting to develop last year, still needs to have some more vision. He talked about how Kyle wanted him down more around the 200 range, and he said that's actually helped him a ton. He's been able to really feel like a much better athlete. He feels like he's able to do what he needs to, uh, he had a little bit of a, a hamstring issue earlier this year and, and or in the camp and had to sit out the first few days. But he's he's ready. He's going. Uh, by all accounts, he should be in that mix as well. And then there's Mike Mitchell. You know, he's he's a bigger body guy. And by bigger, you know, he's he's uh, slightly taller than the other two. Well, more taller than Jalen. But he's he's taller and he's he's got a bigger body, right? Like you look at him and he's your traditional running back. He gets in there. He's He's got that ability to do it. The biggest question around him, though, is more just about him not having that experience. There's no questions about his talent. There's been a ton of talk from the coaching staff and and, and players that say he is the guy, right? He is the guy that, that there's a lot of optimism around. And if he is able to kind of take that to the next level and he has that vision and he's able to do what he needs to, there's a lot of optimism in that staff that Mike Mitchell could be the guy, right? You have this redshirt freshman who can come in and be the guy, and, and, and that would be a huge boon for, for Utah if you can get a guy with a lot of young, you know, a young guy coming in there who's got several years of eligibility, and he can establish that as being the RB1. I mean, that's that's huge. And so, I you know, I, I think that's really their hesitation. It's more just seeing what he can do in actual games. They, they don't doubt his talent. He's in that mix. Uh, there's always been kind of this subtle uh, Mike Mitchell is the guy without fully quite saying that officially type vibes. Um, if you ask Quinton, none of them are ready. So, I mean, he's he's hard to please and, and for good reason because he wants these guys to succeed. But um, Mike Mitchell, there's a lot of optimism around him. Once again, we talked to him as well, and I'm going to share that that uh, interview because I think it kind of shows his approach to the game. I think you see somebody that is hungry to play. You know, he's he's. I don't want to call him satisfied if he's not the number one running back, but he will do whatever the team needs to. But this kid really wants to play. He wants to get out there. He's doing everything he can to be that complete back to be able to see the field. So I'm going to play that one now and, and kind of hear how how he's approaching the game. Like we've heard a lot of good things about you this year. How are you feeling personally just about where you're at right now? Um, right now, I'm really comfortable. I'm getting comfortable with the offense, and right now I'm just I'm fighting for a role. And as a as an underclassman that didn't play last year, a freshman, I'm trying to get that number one role. So I'm I'm working my way up the depth chart, and I'm just trying to bring my A game to practice every day. What's been your What's been your mindset all off season? Um, off season, I mean my off season was everyone's at, at home on a break. I'm here. I'm here in Utah. Just working out, practicing, trying to trying to be the best me. Because if I do the best me, then I can contribute to the team. So I'm just I'm trying to be a contributor. So that's really where I was, that's really where our minds been all season. What was your redshirt season like, and how did that help you? Um, my redshirt season, um, I I was on scout. Uh, I took I took it to the chin. I was, I just gave myself on to the defense. I put I made it seem like a, my game day on Saturday. My game days are during the week in practice. So that's how I really thought about my, my red track season. So, like, I knew I wasn't going to get play time, but I made sure the defense felt me. They knew who I was. So by the time when I could, when I can and my name's called, I'll be ready. Where do you feel you've improved the most from last year to now? Um, on the field, I believe 
my my eyes got better. My just just being around a college team and being in college, I feel like just my senses got better. Knowing knowing which hole to hit, knowing knowing on the the person of the defense and knowing the the uh, the pros and cons I can when I run the ball and who's in front of me. Like if Crane is in front of me, I know what I have to do to get Crane because he's a vet. If someone else is in front of me, I can just run him right over. So. How are, uh, how are you sort of uh, approaching this competition with, with guys that you're close with, like Makai and, and Jalen? Um, first, I look I look up to those dogs. They're, they're they're my older brothers, so I always look at them as you're my comp. But at the same time, I'm learning from you guys. Whatever whatever you guys do, I have to I have to do it ten times better. But at the same time, I have to learn from the mistakes that they do and I and I make. And I, I really look at them as older brothers to me. So. When did you last one? When did you sort of learn that you were gonna get this opportunity to be running back one this season, and, and how did it change your approach from last season? Um, I, to be honest, I was told I was told after after last season how many after Jaquindon left, I took it I took it as it's my chance, it's my it's my time. So I really I really approached this camp. I wanted to come in hot, make make my presence felt, and that's really where I came in. I'm like I want the RB one spot. I don't wanna I don't be two or three if I have to. I will, but RB one spot is what I wanna go for. This is a guy that absolutely wants to play, right? And and that's any player. Like, I don't want to sit here and be like, other guys don't want to play. Uh, but this is a guy that's hungry for it, right? He's doing whatever he can to be able to put himself in a posi- position to succeed. Uh, you have to like what he says where, you know, he, he's he's staying in the offseason, working out. Uh, he's, he's, he's getting in the mix of things where he wants to do whatever he can to learn from the guys ahead of them who he has tremendous respect for, right? Like, obviously, like you said, they're, they're my competition I have to beat them to be able to be the, you know, the top running back. But at the end of the day, like he's doing whatever he can to be able to get that top job. And that, this, you know, this room, like they, they understand it, right? They all want to be that guy. Um, but they, they, they work together. They help each other. This is a team, uh, as one person succeeds, the rest of them succeed. So we'll see what happens with Mike. I think there's a lot of, of optimism, intrigue, um, around who he can be because there's there is tremendous talent there you know in spring when we got to watch a little bit more of that once again we're you know we're not doing full uh going up against the defenses that that they're going to see in in the fall but he's he's breaking off runs and he's got some vision that you know is is really reminiscent of some of Utah's great running backs and so if he can put that together in an actual game I think this this you know is a, a huge win for Utah. You've got a guy that that could be your leading guy for a long time. Uh, you mix and match that with a Makai Bernard, Jalen Glover. Uh, that's that's only great news, right? You get Hunter Andrews, who's another bigger bodied guy who's who did it really well at the high school level. Uh, he's you know trying to learn the system, kind of similar to what Mike was last year. I wouldn't be surprised if Hunter uh, becomes kind of that scout team running back where next year he's competing uh, with Mike and and, and Jalen to be able to kind of uh, be in that mix as well. But uh, this is this is a team that right now uh, there there really is no clear set direction on where they're going to go, right? It, it really is more of a running back by committee instead of that every down back. And for the first little bit, that's fine, right? I, I think... As the season develops, the hope is that one of those guys separates and, and becomes that every down back, that they can rely on them, that they can do that. And, and maybe that's Mike Mitchell, maybe it's somebody else. Um, but I, I, I don't think there's some worry, right? I know there's been some, uh, some angst amongst the fans about, you know, what this running back room will look like. The, the, the question isn't, you know, a problem of, of talent or ability, it's really just a matter of how it's going to be you know, diagrammed on the offensive play sheet, right? How is Andy Ludwig going to use them? Is it going to be more of a mix and match? Is it a guy that's going to get the bulk of the carries? Uh, you know, even you know, even if we go into the game, you know, on that Thursday against Southern Utah, there's a good chance one of these guys they throw out there to be kind of that RB one just to kind of see how he handles it. How does that work and kind of move it forward? It, it it's all gonna be it's all gonna be figured out. I I don't think there's a lot of of worry there. So uh, this will be this will be fun, right? Like I think if you're a Utah fan, this offense provides a lot of optimism. You're excited about it. You want to see kind of how this works. And and granted, anything could be better than last year after sputtering to uh, what Utah did. Still, you had wins over USC. You had uh, took Washington, you know, uh, the, the reigning runner-ups to down to the wire and, and in theory should have won that game. I still contend that if Utah had a pulse in that second half, they win that game. Um, but this is, this is a team that, that has a lot going on for it. Uh, barring, you know, injuries or anything that goes that way, 
this is a team that that's going to be hitting fall ca- or the the, the this season uh, with a lot of of expectations, right? And we've we've seen this, right? Like everybody gets excited from fall camp, and everybody is excited, and then they go sputter against Southern Utah, and you're wondering, okay, why is the offensive line not blocking, and why is the wide receivers dropping passes, and why is Cam throwing interception, whatever it may be. There's going to be those things, right? Like you're going to go to that first game, and you're going to be so hyped, and everything's going to be great, and then there's going to be some things that don't look great, or maybe this is the year where Utah pieces it together and they just steamroll, right? They don't look like they have a weakness. I don't know. Football is a fun sport because you get those week-to-week things. That's what I love doing as a reporter is kind of seeing how a team develops, right? Those first few games of the season, that is kind of those preseason games. You get into it, you see how things go, uh, how players kind of interact with each other, what kind of chemistry do these guys have on the field, what is adversity, what adversity are they going to face, and how do they answer it? You know, sometimes that adversity is themselves in the sense that they buy into their own hype and then they you know, you drop that Baylor game or you, you you squeak out a win against a Baylor team that you should be doing better against. There's, there's a lot of things like that that, you know, we're going to see. Um, but I think everything is setting up for a great season, right? I know we've said that a ton. I know it's kind of the, the, the expectation. But I think you, every position group has those guys that, you you know, Utah feels supremely confident in. This is a team that by and large, probably has the best talent all around that they've ever had, and so they should be better. The fact that Utah's been able to do what they've done with talent less in terms of, you know, rankings and recruitings and other stuff like that and still get two championship games and still be at the level where they're at where I I think Kyle's only had like two or three losing seasons in his entire 20-year career, that says a lot for what Utah's able to do. Now they're getting these higher-level guys. Now what can they do with them? Is this just, you know more of the same or, or what's going to happen. That to me is where the intrigue comes this year. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see it. I'm excited to report on it and, and continue to talk about it each week. So uh, that's, that's it for this week. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I uh, we're going to get more. We're going to get the, the coaches, like I said, tomorrow, uh, kind of see how they break this down. Well, I don't know. Well, we'll see. Sometimes these, sometimes coaches, especially position coaches, are, are tough to please because they want to see a ton more progress, right? And and that's a good thing. Uh, other times, you know, they're they're excited about their position. They're they're all excited. Don't get me wrong, but you you know, we'll see kind of their um, optimism about the team based on kind of how they say things, or maybe they don't have optimism. Maybe they think they're going to suck, right? No. <laughs> uh, but I think this is a, a good spot for Utah. And so we'll, we'll get that next week is expected to be an off week for media. We will probably get a chance to talk to some players, but um, it's, it's generally the week where they allow them to move into school, kind of get ready and acclimate to that. Uh, well, they're still doing their practices and doing everything there. Uh, it's just not going to be a, a media session for us generally. And then we go into game week. So we're, we're right there. Uh, stay tuned because we're, we're close. We'll continue to get some get some stuff going on. I'm hoping to get a, a guest next week that that'll talk about things. So uh, we'll go with that. And, and uh, I'm excited to continue this going and, and, and kind of having this, this season progress. I think there's a lot of fun that could be had if, if everything goes as planned. So we'll catch you next week. And with that, I bid adieu.